Okay, it's welcome to the Lovecraft Easy Video Show. It's May 31st, 2015, and um, we have awesome show today, I think, because we have Joe Pulver as a guest instead of a panelist, and we have Brett J. Talley. Um, Joe has a new book out called A House of Hollow Wounds. Let me actually hold it up here. There we go. Um, really cool book. And I'm not saying that because I'm in it. Um, and then Brett has a new book out called uh, He Who Walks in Shadow, which is a... Do you, uh, you don't have a print yet, do you? I don't have uh, any print copies yet. Yeah, yeah, which is a sequel to um, That Which Should Not Be. Uh, pretty much a direct sequel from what I can tell. Oh, yeah, let me put you on the screen there. Hold that back up. That's a great cover. Yeah, it really is. That pretty much screams this is a Lovecraftian book, you know? Yeah, yeah. I thought about making it a romance, but that's not as good as looking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a Lovecraftian romance. You stay in your own territory, young man. <laughs> yeah, Pete, I'm sorry. You sent that to me. Was I not supposed to send that out to everyone? I didn't understand. Well, you know, if you, if you sent it to everybody, you know, yeah. Okay. I haven't had a chance to read it, Pete. But, it's okay. But, but it's I only this... 24 hours. <laughs> it, only, it only went to 70,000 subscribers. That's right. Yeah, I didn't send it to everybody. <laughs> I will tell you that a, young, a certain young lady in London has read half of it and given me feedback already, so you all are slackers. <laughs> well, I've, I've read your stories in Atomic Age Cthulhu. Cthulhu. Well, okay. And, well, I had already read Beyond the Mounts of Madness because it was in the animators. Yes. Or Weird Company, yes. I mean, Weird Company, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, we're going to... Brett uh, generously agreed to give away... Uh, asked him if he wanted to give away a couple of books, and he said ten. What? So, yeah. We're giving away five signed copies of uh, That Which Should Not Be and five signed copies of He Who Walks in Shadow. So, um, let me send a quick message to Jeff. He needs to uh, uh, turn his computer off and back on. Okay, try that. Uh, okay, uh, Jeff, Thomas is trying to get in here. There he is. He yeah. edited the House of Hollow Wounds. Hey, buddy. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um. You know what? So that's my actually. Uh, hey, Bill. Howdy. You know this Brett guy, don't you? I heard of him somewhere. <laughs> that's from where, though? Hi, Brett. So, Hi. <laughs> you know what? My first question is is for Jeff because you know when I put on my editor hat and I'm sent the Joe Pulver story, I guess the thought crosses my mind when you're. When Joe asks you to edit this book, yes. how the hell do you edit a Joe Pulver book? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, it, the main and I thing don't mean that bad. For those who have not out there who've not read Joe Pulver yet, he's very different. Different is good. So, that, but that's the thing. You have to you, when you go into it. You know, you can't mess with his voice. That's out of the question. You know, because it's all about his voice, his style, his uniqueness. You can't, you know, you can't try to put constraints on him. You know. So, in terms of editing, I was mostly just working in the function of a copy editor, you know, looking for just those little typos that escape us all, you know, and uh, um, I double-checked any reference, you know, anybody's name, um, any kind of word that was in French or something, you know, just to, just to be sure of the spelling, but it was just the, the, that technical aspect of it, just, just double-checking to make sure all the... the, the uh, the I's were dotted, you know, the T's crossed. You know, the, other than that, I I wouldn't have ever dared to uh, impose any stylistic suggestions or say, you know, it's not it's not one of these things where you can say, can you develop this character more? Or can you make this sentence more clear? Or whatever, you, you you cannot, you know, you cannot um, mess with somebody whose vision and somebody whose style is so unique and so personal. It's, it's so idiosyncratic. Yeah, um, I, have, I have copy editors that help 
help me with the magazine and with other things that I publish, and I, I never send them Joe Pulver stuff because for that very reason. There, you know, there's a reason why this, this paragraph is indented and so forth. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry. I said because they quit. Because of what? They quit if you send them something online. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, i got to say something here. I've been wanting to make this comment for a couple weeks. Do you remember when we were talking to those two video game designers? And they were yeah. talking about the... I, the one's not right? as old as my marriage? Yeah, go ahead. Right, yeah. Th th it, was, well, it was just so fascinating to hear them talk about the story and how it was not linear. And uh, that it jumped around from place to place in time and perspective. And then Joe said something, which was that that's that's how my writing is. It's not necessarily linear. It's not to artificially make someone's thought. I'm paraphrasing, but he yeah. doesn't like you know your thoughts are not linear. They they may be in pictures. They may be impulses, emotions sensations that together then when you speak them they may come out a whole lot more coherent than their genesis was and that the internal dialogue going on inside of us isn't isn't a, a textbook and he his and, and Joe said something to the effect that like I'm not trying to spoon feed the reader they have to work to understand the protagonist and what's going on. And I've just been, that's just sort of been fascinating to me. I've been mulling that over for weeks now, uh, going back and reading some of his stories again. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it was obvious, but it, it was just, it wasn't, too. So I just but, put that but, out there. But let's, let's talk about Cisco for a second. You have to work. Who, who, who said literature is supposed to be easy? But, you know, um, we, 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 we've, we've, we've gotten on so many levels throughout so many aspects of our culture and our entertainment, we've homogenized everything. Um, I don't want to read that. There's too much of it. Um, I want to be surprised. I want to be shocked. I, I'm, I'm looking for new voices. I'm looking for new directions. Um, it's easy to go to a place like Amazon and find more of the same. Some, some of us here are old or older and you know, another few years I'll have been reading Lovecraftian material for 50 years. Now, I loved it. I consumed it. I had more than one bookshelf of it. I, I mean bookcase. A af after 50 years when you encounter it, I want something new. You know, there's there's a lot of twenty year old readers and twenty five year old readers, and um, there's a lot of stories that are out there that are good. They're not great. You know, they're somewhere between pedestrian and good. And if you read them on a certain level, they might be entertaining. But you know, you finish the story and the phone rang and you got up and you went in the kitchen and you poured a cup of coffee and by the time you're done stirring in your sugar or whatever do you remember the story? Who wants to read that at this point? You know? Um, you know there's, there's cats like Cisco, there's cats like Jeff here. You know, I, I want to open a book and I want to be amazed. That's what happened to me when I was a kid and a teenager and an early adult, and middle adult, and that's what I'm looking for. You know, it's sure maybe maybe there's one place you can go on vacation your whole life and you really enjoy it. Um, but then some of us, you know, we went here on vacation and we really liked it. We've been back a couple of times. 
but we have been a lot of places on vacation, and we're looking for places we haven't seen yet. Um, that's important. Uh, I don't know. I'm just rambling. Um, no, that's fine. Uh, you know, I, I want other people to jump in with questions for Jeff and Joe, and then we're going to get to Brett a little bit here. But I, I do have a quick question for Jeff, and then whoever wants to jump in. Brett, uh, sorry, Jeff. Uh, someone showed this book and said, I mean, how would you describe this writing? What kind of book is this? Uh, probably not an easy answer. What What would you say to him? Wow, that, that's that's rough. I, I can't even. I wouldn't even know how to describe very easily some, some of my own work. You know, I would say that it's. Yeah. Uh, I would say that it's. Um, it's a, a, a a poetic approach to weird and, and fantastical fiction. Um, you just uh, highly unique. Um, highly stylized. It's it's hard to uh, encapsulate it. It's it's difficult in it, in in describing it. It's a challenge describing it. Just as a challenge absorbing it as a reader, and that's the the beauty of it. And that's that's what what Joe was just saying about reading Michael Sisko's work. You have to work a little harder, you know, and 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 so that makes it more valuable. You know, it makes it more challenging and less and more unique. Um, I was reading an interview recently with Cormac McCarthy. I just finished reading Blood Meridian, and uh, mm -hmm. somebody asked him why he doesn't put his dialogue into quotation marks. And it takes a little while to get used to that to determine when the narr the, the, the narrator it's the narrator's voice or when it, or when it's dialogue. And he says he does it on purpose to make people work harder so they're paying attention right. more. So it's they're not just like speed. You can't speed read Cormac McCarthy, and then, and you can't speed read Joe Pulver or Michael Sisko or, or people, Laird. Yeah, Laird. People who are who are. Who, That's. Who, I was just trying to think of who I asked that. It's Laird. Sometimes he uses dashes instead of yeah. quotations. Scott, Scott Nicolay does that too, and it, it's um it takes a little getting used to, but it forces you to pay attention more. You can't just. You can't just um, go through a, a, one of their stories on autopilot, you know, and so yeah. it, so it's it's more challenging to absorb it, but it's more worthwhile for that effort, and it's challenging to describe what these people do. It's challenging to describe what Michael Cisco does. Well, you did a really good job in the introduction, I think, because uh, for those who don't know, Jeff also wrote the introduction to this, and uh, you talk about uh, Elvis Costello being your favorite singer. But, and I quote, if he were still an unknown and appeared today on the TV program American Idol, those judges would dismiss him from the stage in a moment. Uh, along with his quirky pals Bob Dylan, Tom Waits, and Bruce Springsteen. Because Costello's voice is unique, not to everyone's taste, and that's precisely why I love it. Uh, then you go on to, you know, compare that to Joe. You know, so. And that's what I'm looking for, I'm looking for as a reader. You know, I... It, it's like Joe said. There were some story, a lot of stories. You read them and and, um, and you forget them immediately. And but the, that could be entertaining. You know, not to be a snob. You know, I I sometimes I watch silly, goofy movies, and uh, it's fun at the time. It's not something that's going to. You know, I watched the other night Frankenstein's Army. You know, it's not Vertigo. You know, but but I but I sure, surely don't want to uh, it, it subsist on a on a on a diet of, of things like that. Once in a while, it's it's, it's cool, but. Um, I had that on my DVD, so I'd hear it <laughs> and, 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 and I'm not trying to be snobby. I, I have to be, when I'm writing, who I am. The same way that Jeff does, the same way that Cisco does, the same way that Laird, Laird does. Um, and, and, and to whoever asked the question, how to categorize me, um, if... if if I'm a librarian and I gotta stick me somewhere, um, and we have a few more categories than your normal library, I, I would describe it as mixed genre weird fiction. If you look in a house of hollow wounds, there's a Lovecraftian sequel to a cask of a montalata. Um, oh, it's in there. Um, there's 
um, a Caligari piece. There's um, a bunch of ghoul tales. Um, there's King and Yellow, of course. There's a straight science fiction story in there. Um, uh, well, I think Rodney Turner on the message board, Joe, summed it up. He just wrote, Pulver's writing is non-Euclidean. Well, that's true. But, you know, I don't, when you read this story and you... Creedence Clearwater, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Cre Creedence Clearwater revival. But drop the needle. If you got ten cuts, there's a similarity to every cut. I, on my record, in my book, those ten cuts, they are not the same style. Because, all right, somewhere, and I, for the life of me, cannot, after all these years, remember what poet it was. But some poet once said something along the lines of, a poem is a universe unto itself. And I take that to heart, hardcore. Um, every story is a universe unto itself, even, even if it belongs to some other universe, like the King in Yellow, or Lovecraft, or Caligari, or Ghouls. Um, so when I'm... In, it would take me forever to put together a book where all the stories are thematically so similar that, you know, they belong together. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted my first collection to be mixed genre, and I've stayed there. And the other thing is, when you read the first selection and you turn the page, I don't want you comfortable. I don't want your expectation to have any possibility of knowing what's next. What it looks like, or what it's about, or what length it is. Every tale is a universe unto itself. Every tale dictated not only it's what it was, but what it would be when I was writing it. Um, when we were talking about difficulty, um, if we, if I was an artist, then I would use color and shape to get your attention. I don't have those options. I'm not a musician. I can't use tone and tempo to get your attention. So my page is a canvas. I can, I want to deliver my text. I won't call them all stories because some people call them this and some people call them that. Um, you know, parables, whatever. I, I don't write the hype. I just laugh at it when I read it. Um, Rick, can I have a question for Joe and Jeff? Yeah. Now, um, yeah um, like I said, it, it's a canvas. I control. I want to control not only what you're reading, but how you're reading it. Matt was, what Matt was talking about before, is, you know, if 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 you read this sentence, and it's a big, long legati of sentence, and then all of a sudden you have seven one-word paragraphs in a row, then. I change the speed at which you read. I direct your... I, I'm, I'm pulling more of your script strings than just the story. And I think there's some people out there who say that's a parlor trick. I, I disagree. That is assisting you or trying to show you something that for me, I don't think words can show you. It, it's a combination of elements. Um, but, okay, I'll shut up. Rick, go ahead. Okay. Um, one thing that Joe has always stressed in editing a book is determining the order of stories. Now, there's yeah. too many stories to go, go into here, but it starts off with this, a thousand injuries and ends with a cold yellow moon. And I'm curious as to 
what motivated making that those stories the beginning and the end of the collection. <laughs> Um, when I was assembling, Je Jeff had told somebody he wanted to edit me, and I couldn't, I jumped, of course, to work with Jeff. Um, and, and a, a finer copy editor, I don't, as far as that aspect, I don't know I've ever even heard of, let alone worked with. <clears throat> he writes um, and draws, too, I hear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, the, he does so much stuff. I'm afraid if we ask him this thing, we find out that there is a clear hole in his talent. Um, I was just dropping things in a file, and I had just finished that story, and it had come back from a couple beta readers who told me they really liked it. Um, and so I dropped that in first. And apparently Jeff thought it was fine what it was where it was. Um, and pretty much I just dropped things in as I was dropping them into the master file. Okay, this is this short, this is this long, this is really weird, this is kind of there's a Later in the book, there's another Poe-inspired story called Brick by Brick. Um, and the language is very short, very terse, and very simple. Um, but it's a Poe story, so it, I wanted it as far away from the, you know, the first story as possible. Um, but then... You know, it's really short. It's a certain kind of language. It can't go next to this, this, and this. So you start, you're, you're trying to make a puzzle, you know, out of pieces. You've got all these pieces, but you don't have the picture. So this piece fit here, and that one goes there. And that's why things wound up where they wind up. I, I, I put together an anthology a little different, but not much different. You know, Joe, something I wouldn't want to ask you about for a while, especially in front of an audience, is every story I read of yours, I, I believe every story, when you get to the end, it, you you see a playlist. Most of them, yeah. Yeah. You, you want to talk about that a little bit? I, I, always like, I always like author notes at the end of a book, and... Those are literally my author notes. Um, uh, normally, you know how people love to ask writers, where do you get your ideas from? Normally it's a word or two out of one of those songs is what started me down the road. Um, and... It may not be the word or two in the, in if you could figure out what's um, I don't know if it was Iron Maiden. Can I play with madness? Let's say it might be not. It might not be the word in there that you would think that would make somebody write a horror story. Um, but I just started one day. I kept track of what I was listening to. I don't know why. And I left it there. And when we were doing my first collection and I sent the stuff to ST, he's like, what is this? I said, oh, those are my author notes. What I, and he's like, oh, okay. I just assumed he'd take them out. He didn't, so there they are. <laughs> so I just keep doing it. Um, that's 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 all that is my extremely twisted version of an author note. Well, it's pretty cool. Uh, for everybody watching, let me remind you, we're going to give away ten books in a little while, so um, signed copies. So we'll get into that later. Hey, you know, I've known both you guys for about four years now. I think. How did you guys meet, Jeff and Joe? 
uh, I can't remember this the specific uh, <clears throat> way that we that we first met. It's funny. Some I've known a lot of people for years and years, and sometimes I can. As in the case of W. H. Pugmire, I was called upon to illustrate one of his stories, and that's how we started communicating. I don't remember how Joe and I first started communicating, but I remember it was back in the nineties. Yeah. Um, uh, long phone conversations for hours. Long, yeah, long phone conversations. Um, Stan Sargent knew Jeff before I did, and and I remember Jeff's name and talking about Jeff with Stan a whole bunch. And then the next thing I remember is we started talking on the phone. Um, and, you know, Jeff and, well, Stan as well, um, l lengthy, lengthy, lengthy phone calls. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was great to talk about somebody you really admire and respect about the work. Um, for me it was um, important um, to encounter a, a creator as talented as Jeff um, who was so generous because back, back then I was just trying to find my sea legs. You know, I, I'm still not comfortable with doing this. I'm, you know, trying to get better. Um, but back back then it was like hell. I might have intellectually known where I was, but I and I might have been able to actually track it how I got there. But I sure as hell didn't know how I got there, um, and sure didn't think I belong there. You know. Um, so I mean, that was just one of those. Things we talked a lot, you know, and for a long time, just wonderful, great conversations. Um, was the first personal meeting at one of the Lovecraftian conventions? Yeah, just uh, at Necronomicon in uh, 2013. Yeah. Was the after? Yeah, I mean, there was a few. There was a few times over the years. I mean, I, I could have drove to Jeff's house in I don't know three and a half hours. <laughs> Straight shot out ninety. Um, and, and I think we talked about that. It just never happened, you know. Um, You're a little further away now. Just a little bit. Yeah. You know. Um, hey, at least at least I didn't, you know, leave the planet just yet. That'll probably be coming sooner rather than later. <clears throat> um, you know, but, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. You know, but I but I do remember Stan Sargent being, you know, talking about Jeff a lot, and, okay. and I had read some things that I really adored, and um, probably knowing Stan was, oh, he's a great guy. Just call him. Blah blah. Yeah, he you know, and. Uh, I'm sure that's ultimately what happened. Is like, you know, uh, you know, Stan doesn't say he likes something if he doesn't. You know, Stan, sort of Stan somebody. doesn't say anything other than 100% unadulterated truth, because Stan's got this attitude, credo that I got. We're both too stupid to lie, um, <laughs> because. Next week we won't remember what we told you. So if today I say A, and two weeks from now you ask me a question and I'm going to talk about something, if I didn't tell you the truth, I, I, you know, it, it wouldn't go good. Um, so, you know, it, it not only is it a good thing not to lie, but some of us aren't intelligent enough to. Uh, to do it well, or to remember what we said two weeks ago or two years ago. Actually, that's that's a Harry Truman quote. He said, that <laughs> "Oh, is it? If, yeah." He said, "If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said." Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I love Harry, so right on. Yeah, wasn't he in Twin Peaks too? 
<laughs> what? <laughs> if Harry S. Truman, that should be easy to remember. Uh, you guys have questions? I don't want to hog the forum here. Um, can I just say, Mr. Pulver, that I, I for the first time today... It's just uh -oh. Joe. Okay. No, 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 it's just Joe. I don't know any Mr. Pulver. <laughs> okay, Joe. Uh, I read one of your stories for the first time today. Oh, poor girl. <laughs> no, I quite enjoyed it. And, you know, in a, some way, I don't know if this will mean anything to you, but have you ever read any M. John Harrison? I have not, no. He's, he's a literary writer, but he, he has his philosophy of writing is a little bit like yours. And... What I found about the story was that I liked it and it pulled me along and when it ended, I was like, no, <laughs> this can't be the end. Because I was very like, you know, <coughs> frustrated with, I wanted it to go on, but I understood why it ended there. Well, I had to sit I, back and think about it for a while. You can ask me and I won't be able to tell you because <laughs> I think it was <laughs> I, I can tell you and I'll tell you by the end. I have okay. to go look at what the name of it was. Yeah, you know, for those who do not know, this very show is in the book. Uh in a story oh, called yeah. A Big Fishy Menu. So uh it I think this started as wanting to kill Pete Rollick and went from there. <laughs> well, yeah, because cause on here I've been threatening to kill him for how long, so, you know, um, and I broke my, it's one of the few times I broke my King and Yellow regulation. Um, yeah. Well, let's face it, Pete's Lovecraftian, so I thought it needed a Lovecraftian element, so. Pete is Lovecraftian. That explains yeah, a lot. Just a little tiny bit on occasion. And his writing, too. <laughs> oh, his writing is? I, I yeah. haven't read any of his writing. Yeah. I didn't know he wrote Lovecraftian. I just meant about appearance and the boat and things like out on the water and things like that. Yeah, it says at the end where the song playlist usually is, it says, well, there's a song playlist, too. Uh, after the Lovecraft easing chat on November 11, 2012. Wow. So. It, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I do remember after one chat deciding that's it, Raw. Like you're getting yours, you son of a bitch. <laughs> um, and that apparently is what came out of that. Now, you know, I mean, there's some nights where we poke fun at each other endlessly, and I'm sure that was one of them, but. Any particular details from that, I do not recall. Uh, some, something, some, something some about weirdo. Davis sits, there, Davis sits there in mission control like some cool power broker, spewing his yellow journalism <laughs> and directing <laughs> the <laughs> And uh, basically about Pete's death and torture or something to that effect. That's what I got out of it anyway. And yeah, what well, I was hoping to get out of it. That's that's Nair Lathotep in the King in Yellow playing a chess game and and I guess uh, Pete would wound up be a pawn in their game. Is Nair Lathotep your favorite great old wand when edited by Lovecraft show? Because you seem to use them a lot. Yes and no. Um, to to use yes because I love the trickster aspect of Nair Lathotep. And I love that he can have so many incarnations. Um, but I have an immense fondness for Frank Long's, or no, for, for Chogner Fong, for, for Blocks. Um, I, I absolutely hate Cthulhu. I never, that 15 year old Bill Pulver, I'm sorry? I don't think he likes you either. He, I'm sure he doesn't. <laughs> um, I, I just never, I never found that particular image frightening. I mean, I'd encountered Godzilla before. I like Godzilla. Cthulhu, you know, changing Godzilla's head 
for an octopus head and then sticking wings on it didn't appeal. Um, you know. But yeah, Rick, I, I adore Nair Lafatep. Um, uh, he's just the one. You said a minute ago you broke a rule for that story, and I, I think that's, that would be interesting to talk about for a minute. Uh, your sure. rule on the King in Yellow, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, the Lovecraftian mythos, because a lot of people do see them as somewhat the same, and they're not. They're they're related, right, well, but they're definitely they're, not. The they're, same. they're all right. Okay. Um, I've been reading Lovecraft for a few years, um, and certainly at that point, it was the '60s. Lovecraft had been strained through Derelith. Derelith had control. Derelith was spoon feeding us. We did not. This is a long time before Lovecraftian scholarship. This is even previous to Sprague and Camp's biography. So we had no nonfiction on Lovecraft. We were reading the material. And I came upon. Um, a Robert W. Chambers, uh, the yellow sign story, and it blew my mind. Um, and as things moved along, I pursued Chambers, and of course I pursued Lovecraftian literature. And then here comes Carl Edgar Wagner with The River and Night's Dreaming. And there's no Lovecraft there. It's Chambers. And then we discover over a period of time that Derelith hijacked. In, in Der, Derelith wanted to codify the Cthulhu mythos and proposed it to H.P. Lovecraft, and Lovecraft told him, sorry, kid, we're not going there. But Lovecraft died, and Derelith took over, and Derelith, you know, um, codified the Cthulhu mythos. And one of the things he wanted to do was bring in Chambers things and... The King in Yellow, Carcosa, Pasteur, um, and he wanted to incorporate them in the Cthulhu mythos and also alter them. But case in point would be Hastur, which is not an entity in Chambers. It's a place. So, um, and, um, so Daryl with Hijack Chambers transformed it into something it was not and wasn't intended to be. And then along came Chambers who ripped it out of the Cthulhu, ripped the Chambers material out of the Cthulhu mythos and attempted to return it to its um, roots. And that's what I loved, those four Chambers core tales and, and Wagner. And even though I had read a lot of Derelith, after the Chambers and the Wagner, it's like I just couldn't hack Derelith's interpretation anymore. He'd soiled it and broken it, and I wasn't having it. So when I finally no, began... Joe, if, you, if you leave for a second Derelith out of it, and you talked about the differences, and I, I, I take your points very well. Uh, what do you see as the similarities between the King and Yellow mythos, maybe isn't the best word, and the Lovecraft mythos? You know, the cosmic uh, horror aspect. What, what, would, what would your answer to be, be to that? It was certainly, certainly both Lovecraft and Chambers um, use Bierce's cosmic horror. Um, you know, <clears throat> Lovecraft goes one place. Uh, Chambers goes to a different place. Um, they're they're very similar, but they're a little different. Um, you know, we don't have these entities in Chambers that we have in in, in Lovecraft. Um, in, in Chambers, we have the King in Yellow. That's our entity. You know, um, what or what they may not be. As far as the characters in the play, um, that's they're, they're probably not aliens. <laughs> um, yeah. There again, they, but Derelith just you know it's it, it's hard. 
his codification is so severe um, that I, I just couldn't stomach it. The other thing too is after in discovering Chambers' core stories and the Wagner, I did not want Chambers' works to be some little moon circling the Cthulhu mythos. I want it to be its own entity. It is worthy of being its own mythology for, for lack of a better word. Um, there is so much mystery to what Chambers left us. And Wagner. Wagner writes one of the most magnificent uh, tributes uh, to, to, to the King in Yellow. It, it's absolutely canon, and yet he does exactly what Chambers did. He doesn't explain one iota of it. It's, it's what continues to draw me back. There's such a rich well and the mystery. Um, just as vast as anything. The mystery within the King and Yellow canon is as vast as the cosmos, literally. And that's all I want to do is keep chambers pure. Now, because of gaming and, and a lot of Lovecraftian fiction, there's an awful lot of people out there who don't realize that the King in Yellow started as something completely different. It did not influence Lovecraft in any way, shape, or form. And while Lovecraft was alive, it was never a part of the Cthulhu mythos. Those couple of mere mentions of the King in Yellow and I forget the other one those are tips of the hat that's like oh, I like that you know um, yeah. that wasn't Lovecraft trying to include them into the pseudo mythology he was building um, but so every, a lot of people nowadays know the King in Yellow via gaming um, through Lovecraftian fiction that Kate was handed down from Derelict and I just want to return the King in Yellow to its natural roots. Uh, Ken has a question for you from the message board. Uh, she says, Joe, a bit ago you said each story is a universe all its own. Do you have any of your story universes that you find yourself wanting to do crossovers for or that you've done crossovers for? Hmm. Mm. I... Mm. I will occasionally, and Rick can address this better than I can because he knows my stuff better than I do. I just write it. <laughs> I, I'll occasionally drop in something from another story, um, but that's more just to, to mess with people than anything else. Um, there is way in the back of my head some attempt to try to, in the most limited, vague manner, create a body of superficially attached things. But, you know, unlike Laird, I'm not building my own mythology. Unlike Lovecraft or, or Willem, I'm not, at this point, per perhaps quite a bit of my King in Yellow is tied together, but that would be the only thing. What do you think, Rick? Well, I was, uh, was going to ask Joe, I noticed that you started to bring in a little bit of Arthur Mackin in this collection. You had the white people working for I the I love, I love the white people, and I was at the Griffin's home staying there in Portland, and Mike Griffin is multi-talented. Not only is he a great writer, he's a hell of a musician, um, he's done art, and in his living room, there was a there's a photograph that's above the fireplace and it's bare trees it's a black and white photograph it's bare trees and there's fog and I stood there one morning staring at that picture for 10 minutes maybe more and it seemed to me the fog was sort of shaped like people but they were tall and they were hellishly thin and distorted and you know there was some 
aspect that if you could make trees be people that were expressionistic, Caligari expressionistic, that's what I was looking at. And at one point later in the day, I told Mike Griffin, you should write a story about it. There's a lot. There's a story in this picture. These are people, you know. You know, they're like thin people. So thin people stuck in my head. And I, one of those things, you know, Phil Collins wrote to studio, and he was going to change it to a girl's name, but he could never figure out what the girl's name is, so he just left the studio. Well, I, I typed once the thin people and went kept going. And I meant to go back and change it into something interesting, but I couldn't figure out what was interesting, so... Yeah, so I'm starting to use the thin people in occasional stories. I think I have in three now. Because these same things, even though I didn't name them, show up in a Laird Barron tribute in Children of Old Leech as well. Are the white people synonymous with the thin people? Pardon me? Or the white people in the uh, or Arthur Mackin's the white people, the same creatures yeah, as Yeah, so, some somewhere some looking in this picture at these things, I and and and, and Mike Griffin lo and his wife love to go out into the deep woods and walk and and I never did anything that I considered even remotely attached to to Mackin and I guess this was my is my attempt to start looking at that. Um, one of the things somewhere in the back of my mind, that little list is, you know, I want to write a this story and a that story and a that story. <coughs> Excuse me. And somewhere in the back of my head is, where's my mocking story? I mean, you know, some people are going to write a lot of great mocking work. Um, but I'm not a mocking, mocking guy, even though I appreciate it. But I want to write one good one, maybe, or try to write a good one. <clears throat> you know, it's like, you know, I'm... But, yeah, there, there's mocking in there in my own twisted way. But are the thin people and the white people supposed to be the same creatures? Or are they different? I don't know. Um, I, I didn't. I wasn't trying to make them the same. But if if you go there, that's fine and dandy to me. You know. Um, uh, one thing I was I, that I have seen recur in uh, Joe's stories is I, once in a while he'll drop in a reference to Doctor Archer. From oh. the novel *The Orphan Palace*, that, that seems like something that we may see more of in the future. Is that true, Joe? Yeah, I love Archer. Um, Archer is, you know, King in Yellow, Carl Wagner, *Rivers Nights Dreaming*, um, uh, *Repair of Reputations*. Uh, I, Archer's one of those people who, in my mind moves through time. He moves through the Carcosa mythology. Um, and I, even though I, Rick was the first one to point out Archer as, 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 as yellow in the Orphan Palace, I didn't see it. I, that's not what I intended, but once Rick pointed it out and I went returned to it and looked at it, I see what he's talking about and he's right. Um, so yeah, I like Archer. He'll continue to show up. Um, you know, we we learn that his first name is Carl, at least in some incarnations in this collection. Right, and there, of course, the reason for that is Wagner. You know, it had to be Carl. So um, I'm what a little bit obsessed with Wagner too. I I confess I. I, I I love Wagner's stuff. Um, I think the the River of Night's Dreaming is one of the finest short stories I've read ever. It's certainly I think one of the best of the latter half of the 21st century, and I'm not the only one who thinks that. If you read the introduction to Wagner's A Lonely Place, 
Um, Peter Straub says the same thing. Um, you know, I, I love Wagner, whether it's Kane or as an editor for the Daw um, Year's Best Horror series, um, his his horror fiction. So, yeah, it was it was how I got to use Wagner. Of course, I I have had Carl Wagner as a character now in two King and Yellow stories. Um, one where he's has a lengthy phone call with Bob Dylan, and the other one where they're sitting around at my uh, Viking funeral. Yeah, I love that story. It was fun. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever going to understand it, but it was fun right there. Um, I, I mean, I like using us in my work. I like bringing in... I mean, when I killed Pete in... What's the name of that thing? A big a fishy menu. Or something, whatever. A big fishy menu. <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I got to slap Pete around, and I a lot of fun for me too. Oh, sorry. I mean, I really adore that old Lovecraftian parlor game where we, you know, Robert Block and H.P. Lovecraft. You know, so it, it's 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 my chance to like, you know, indirect well directly play with Pete. And I'm hoping you know when he sat down and when he first read it, he had a big grin on his face. Oh, I had know? a grin too. Yeah, it's um, a great story. Um, that's a lot of fun. Um, it's like sometimes I think my material is drop dead bleak and serious, but other times I want it to be. Yes, my worldview is dark and grim. My worldview is semi legati, but I want to have a little fun once in a while too. Your your story in um, years best. Uh, Weird Fiction was a tribute to Pugmire. That was yeah. another fun story of a similar, of a similar type. Yeah, I mean, Streisand and, you know, here's a couple of, a couple of lines out of Will, different Will stories by Willem, and I rephrased a couple of comments he made in old letters. I'm not even sure he'd recognize the comments, but they were his. Um... You know, um, I, I'd like to pay tribute when it comes up. There's a handful of people out there I really love, and s sooner or later, they'll get their comeuppance. <laughs> uh, well, the, the book is called uh, House of Hollow Wounds, Joseph S. Pulver Sr. You can get it at Amazon. You can go to the... Um, let me put you on screen there. You can hold that back up, Jeff, if you don't mind. And... Uh, Yep, a little bit back. And um, you can get it at Hippocampus. Um, you can get it um, at Amazon, uh, like I said, or at the Hippocampus website. I've also linked to it on today's post about the show, and if you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, I've got it linked down below in, in the About section or whatever they call it. I, I want to mention a couple of other books, too. Uh, Joe's got a King in Yellow um anthology coming up called Casilda's Song, and we're all waiting on the table of contents on that. I'm sure that'll be great. I, I've already started posting that on Facebook. Oh, okay. And and the, the cover art is done. We'll have a finished, finished cover with graphics sometime late next week. Um, uh, it's, it's women... Only women writing um, stories that deal with King and Yellow and Carcosa and, and, and aspects of Chambers. It's a great cover, too. I'm sorry? It's a great cover, too. Yeah, Steve Santiago did a, a you know, um, I, I, I want more women in this pond. I want to hear their voices. Um, I do not want... Um, the old school men only thing. Um, if if we look at what's going on in weird fiction currently, there are, we could spend the next twenty minutes just naming women who are among the best writers working. Period. 
um, or maybe I should say exclamation mark. Um, and, and it's what I, I, I want to I came. It shouldn't be just guys playing this game. We have a talent pool that's we are privileged right now to have. And if, if, if I got a little power up on my little tiny soapbox, I want to promote, you know, best I can. When will that be out? Approximately? Real soon. Okay. Both that and the leaves of a Necronomicon definitely by the Providence Convention. Casilda song will probably be out a, a month before the convention. Uh, Leaves of a Necronomicon, which I'm literally finishing right now, um, just before the convention. Um, I want to mention another book. This one's by Jeff Thomas. It's a new chat book, and the publisher tells Yay, me as of yesterday. Jeff Thomas. Yeah, there's. 50 or 60 copies left. It's a limited 100 copies. Um, Jeff, can you talk about the title and maybe just a few words about that? That, that um, story is called Ghosts in Amber, and I wrote it uh, especially for um, Sam Cowan's uh, new press, Dim Shores. And uh, he's going to be doing a, a line of chapbooks uh, limited to 100 copies each. Um, Weird, weird fiction chapbooks, and mine will be the first. I'm very proud about that. And like I say, Sam um, approached me and asked me if, if I would give him something for for that for the first chapbook. So I wrote him that story specifically, and um, I really don't want to say too much about it. It's uh, it's weird. Ghost. <laughs> well, before we get to Brett, two questions for Jeff here. Sean Lewis wants to know, will Jeff send us to hell again? Uh, yes, uh, I have a novella called uh, uh, Acheron, which is coming out in a book called I Am the Abyss from um, Dark Regions Press. And there'll be other novellas in that book from people like Laird Barron and Kate McKiernan. And so my story, each story involves um, hell. And mine will be set in the same hell that I wrote about in my novel, Letters from Hades, and in a few other books. Cool. And then Joseph Arp wants to know what kind of writing schedule you stick to, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> hi, Joseph Arp. Um, I don't really have any specific schedule. It, it's hard. I just I, my free time is very limited, and so I actually lately have get most of my writing done like breaks at work. You know, and uh, it's rough. It's it's rough. If I didn't have editors, seriously, it's not a joke. If I didn't have editors like Joe Culver and Brian Sammons, kind of putting the heat on me, putting some pressure on me once in a while, I wouldn't be getting as much done as I do. Um, Joe is uh, is an anthologist in first order, and um, I'm proud to be in any project that he invites me to. But sometimes I, 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 I think, oh, I'm too busy. I'm not going to make this project. I'm not, I'm not going to make this deadline. Joe kind of keeps nudging me about it, and I, you know, I'll see if I can. And, and, and then I'm after I begin something, and it takes off, and I'm so grateful that he, he didn't give up on me. He really wanted that story from me. And oh, there, there's, there, there. Just let me jump in here for a second. There's no way in hell I will ever give up on Jeff. Back 20 years ago when him and I were talking or whatever, and he had told me he had started a Cthulhu Mythos punk town novel, and he abandoned it. And I don't know exactly what I said. It might have, might have been New York English that I laid on him. Um, you know you know how Pulver gets um, when he's not on the Lovecraft Museum chat. Um, but Jeff ultimately sent me what he'd written. And so Joe Pulver's sitting there reading half of a 40% of a Jeff Thomas novel, and I was blown away. And I just started in on them. You know, it's like you, you can't abandon this. This is too damn good, blah, blah, blah. And, and ultimately, he finished it, and it was monstrosity. Yeah. Um, 
and this and this is the debt you owe to people sometimes. Now, Joe inspired me to finish Monstrosity. Monstrosity came out. It was it, it was nominated for a Bram Stoker Award. People noticed it. Um, people at um, Games Workshop they had a, a a book imprint at the time called Black Library. Because they had noticed Monstrosity, they came to me and uh, asked me if I would consider pitching them some ideas. And out of that came my mass market novels, Dead Stock and Dead War, which were, uh, they might, my, uh, the books that of mine have had most distribution and most widely read. And so that wouldn't have come about if it had not been for Joe pushing me to finish Monstrosity and then Monstrosity getting out there and get, garnering attention. And, 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 I, and in my career, such as it is, I've, I have certain people to thank for for inspiring me, and like people like Jeffrey Endemir, who published my first Punk Town book. And they've had, uh, I, I can't credit them enough for the, for the impact they've had on my, on my career. So that's why, uh, uh, and Joe and I, it's, it's, it's exciting and, and, and rewarding that to this day, he invites me to his his um, his anthologies. I edited um, House of Hollow Wounds. I edited another book of his, The Protocols of Ugliness, that will be coming out. And he's going to edit a, a book of mine. And, and so we're you know it's just this we're com compatriots in, in, in weird fiction and, and uh, collaborators, and, and we sh hopefully strengthen each other and, and open opportunities to for each other. And it's just. Uh, it's exciting, and that's the community. That's the, the love and the loyalty in the community. Yep. Well said. So uh, anyway, go out and buy A House of Hollow Wounds, and when after you're done reading it, leave a review on Amazon. Uh, Please. That helps the author very much. Re go review Jeff's books and review mine, and you know, <laughs> be honest. People, people think that it's... Only our friends who go to Amazon and review these things and whatnot. Um, we 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 need to be supported. We want to be supported, but we don't want a review that isn't truthful. Um, uh, support the small press. It's it's. So much great work is being done by the small press. Stop and, you know, to all the people watching, stop and think about how much small press weird fiction you're buying. It's it's really where it's all happening. Not to say that there isn't stuff from the majors that's mind-blowingly good. You know, we can talk about things like that, like the new Paul Tremblay book, Head Full of Ghosts. But... You know, look at what Ross Lockhart's doing with, with Word Horror. Look at what they're doing with Lazy Fascist. Um, look, look at just small presses got it. They got Jeff Thomas. What else do I got to say? Oh, by the way, some guy named Scott Thomas is, says he's watching and enjoying the show, too. Yeah, so. Oh, that guy, He you know, he's occasionally pretty good, too, I hear. Uh, that's what I heard. Somebody yeah. should publish a book of his someday. Yeah, yeah. maybe, may, maybe he should think about you know talking to a publisher or something. Yeah, he should. Yeah, he's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, he's he's gonna. I talked him into. I don't know how much talking I did. I asked if he wanted to write a sequel to Sea of Ash, and he said yeah. So. That's that's fantastic news. So he's wasting his time watching this instead of writing that. Yeah, exactly. I got a couple words for him. You should be writing. <laughs> yeah, turn off the goddamn TV and start typing. Maybe he's not here for Jeff and Joe. Maybe he wants to uh, uh, win a Brett Talley book. Oh, okay. That's probably why he's here. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> a See, signed Brett Talley book. Sea of Ash really does. It's really worthy of a sequel. Yeah. Yeah, because the only Scott, criticism Scott is really, really says is, is they wish they could have gone on longer. So, you know, it, you know, I, I'm going to echo something that that Jeff said. Joe, as an anthologist, um, what I what I really appreciate about it is that being being pushed into places, which he's already talked about, where I'm not comfortable, where. I'm outside my 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 comfort zone, and I'm going into places 
where I really don't know where I'm going to end up. And, uh, you know, I've, Joe has taken a story, and it is not my usual pastiche. It's very different. Um, well, yeah, and you're writing romance novels now. Yeah, and I'm writing a romance novel right yeah. now. Yeah, and, and I, read a couple, I read a couple chapters. Well, you know, it's like Chambers. He's got to do something to bring in the bucks, and then he writes what he really wants. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think I think Pete's secret life is he's working his way into writing pure porn under a different name. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, that's what you do out on that damn yacht with all them young girls. I can I can name a handful of authors just off the top of my head who I know have written porn. Don't it make, don't make, let make, Brian McNaughton secret of it. Pay the bills. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Fifty Shades of Reanimator, 2018. Oh my I, God! You have not read enough of this novel yet, Joe. There, there is. I some. only read two chapters. You yeah, know, I, I am really busy about that. I want to read Reanimator porn. It there is Reanimator porn. No. You should send him. You should send him what you got so far, Pete. Jeff, the title of the new novel is Reanimatrix, an Arkham romance. Awesome. <laughs> So, so anyway, anyway uh, yes, there is. About this Brett Talley guy, uh, okay. he, he wrote a book called uh, That Which Should Not Be, um, and now he's written that, which I really enjoyed uh, and said so at the time, and now he's written a sequel called um, He Who Walks in Shadow, which is pretty much a direct sequel. Um, I'm... Of course, I've read all of, of That Which Should Not Be uh, a couple there years ago. Is there any in it? <laughs> uh, I think he's working, like Pete, he's working towards that in the third book. So, okay. Because um, it's important to heat things up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Pete. <laughs> That's the reference I'm going to <laughs> I have a heart attack. I'm not, Pete. <laughs> you guys remember how old Pete is. Come on. Uh, so anyway. He's pretty uh, good. He's got a pretty good memory. I'm sorry, Brett. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're back, to Brett, away, uh, back, back to Brett's porn book. <laughs> <laughs> Brett's going to give away ten porn books today. Uh, five of That Which Should Not Be and five of He Who Walks in Shadow. You know, you can sort of wow. see those. Those are good titles for... Uh, for Lovecraftian erotica, I think. Yeah, exactly. I let, let, let me put you back. Go ahead and put that back up. Thanks. Oh, he's got a print copy, Brett. Why don't you have a print copy? Oh wow! See, that's the problem. Just people. Yeah. Actually, it says the... it says on the website it's supposed to be in hardcover. Dude. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's gonna. Yeah, I don't know. You can get it from the publisher in hard copy. We're still working on the Amazon hard copy thing. Hey, wait, wait, and don't you owe me a copy? I do owe you a copy. I actually don't have any copies myself because we sort of sold out in the initial run, you know, which is a good thing, but I ended up not actually getting any copies. <laughs> so he's I'm waiting on the... A, uh, he's going to sign a Kindle thing. copy for you, Pete. All right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, give me some Kindle time. Copy. Yeah, that, uh, so I don't know if I should ask Brett this question or Rick this question, but uh, it, the timeline of both of these books... And Rick is, is very good at this kind of thing. So is Pete, actually. Mm. But, you know, the, the hero of the first book, protagonist, might be more accurate. Uh, and I don't want to give away any plot spoilers for those who have not read either book. But he's in the, uh, he, he disappears at the beginning of the second book, uh, Carter Weston. Correct. But, uh, and then you know, Henry Armitage uh, and another character goes after him. Uh, I don't know how much of a spoiler would be to name that person or not, but uh, probably not. Uh, probably. Him and him and his him and Rachel go after him, looking for him. Uh, but he's all, he, you know Henry Armitage is friends with him in uh, that which should not be. And if my memory is correct, Henry in the first book was more into the occult and stuff than Carter was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so as far as the timelines go, you know that which should not be. Uh, and, and, yeah, not, I'm, I'm not that worried about spoilers, but but if you're worried about spoilers, you know, close your ears now. <laughs> In the beginning of, of that, you know, that which should not be, it starts 
Yeah, around 1933 or so. Well, there's spoilers about, like, this is kind of what it's about, and then there are spoilers like, this is how it ends. You yeah, know? like, yeah, yeah, everybody dies in the end. Anyways, so, <laughs> but, and then it goes back in time to when Carter was a student, and he was very uh, skeptical about, uh, you know, he, he, was a, he, was a, he was an empiricist, he was a materialist, so he didn't believe in any of this stuff. He didn't believe in, in God's old, new, in between. Right. Um, and sort of the story of that, which shouldn't be in a lot of ways, is the story of his his journey from skeptic to believer. And in He Who Walks in Shadows, you know, we learn because that book also, you know, has a sort of a distorted timeline. It goes back in time. It's in the well, it's always in the past, but it goes back in time. It's you know in the present when the action's taking place, and you learn a lot about Carter Weston, even though he's he's disappeared, and you learn the, that he went. He's basically the exactly. present being 1932, right? Exactly. I, I believe. Um, yeah, go ahead. And you learn that he's basically gone from being a skeptic to a believer to a zealot. So by the time we're in the 30s, he, he is absolutely committed to stopping the return of the old ones, basically. He's willing to do anything and make any kind of sacrifice to make that happen. So, um, so well, well, hang on. Let me stop here. Rick, I know you got things to say, and I know you got questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rachel's last name is Jones. Yes. And uh, it, it seems deliberate because I kept thinking of another Jones as I was reading this story. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know it's interesting. That is not why she's named <laughs> Rachel Jones. <laughs> and I thought about that. When I got to the end of the book, I was like, man. Are people going to be like, is this is this an Indiana Jones reference? Because there actually is an Indiana Jones reference in the book, but but but, but it's not. It, she's actually named after one of my good friends, who I always thought, you know, going along with what Joe was talking about, who always thought, man, Rachel Jones, that's just a great name for an investigative reporter. That was my first thing, Rachel Jones, investigative reporter. And so she starts out in the book, she's an investigative reporter, but she gets fired. So you know, she has plenty of time to do things like try and figure out what happened to her father, who's. That, that is convenient. <laughs> <laughs> now, to get back to some of the things we discussed with Joe, you uh, used Nyarlathotep in this story, mm -hmm. and you uh, conflate him with the king in yellow. Yep. Which, I understand the logic behind it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can just explain for why some people might say, no, they should be different. Yeah, it was funny. I actually got an email from somebody uh, about that. They're like, "Oh, I love the book, but isn't isn't you know, Tep actually Haster? And, and you know, how, did, how does that work out?" And I said, "Well, you know, you know, basically going back to what Joe was saying, you know, there's Durleth and what he did, and how he set up the whole mythos, and how he set up sort of the categories, and, and this guy's an old god, and this guy's an elder god, or an old one, or a deep one, or whatever. And I just, you know, I'm never really worried about that stuff." Um, I obviously because you're you exactly. We that's my thought. We don't want you to be Derelict, and we don't want you to be Rollick, and we don't want you to be Pulver. You know? Well, everybody wants to be Pulver, but go on, bro. Oh. And I and I think you know I love H.P. Lovecraft, but and I've said this before. I'm not sure H.P. Lovecraft would love me. I don't think he would necessarily like the things that I write um, because my philosophy is a little different than yours. Um, but Brett, you're a young guy. Let me let me tell you something. Get in line. Way in the back. This line goes by age. <laughs> he wouldn't like Rollick, and he wouldn't like me, and probably wouldn't like Jeff. So, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. And it's interesting, and I'm sure everybody probably, you know, on this chat who's who's done any Lovecraft and writing has ran into this. Um, that one should not be, you know, a lot of people really like that which should not be. And really the biggest criticisms I got were from people who were very, very, very dedicated to Lovecraft and thought and said, basically, you know, Lovecraft never would have written this. Like, how, how, could, you, how could you do this, <laughs> basically? Um, well, you know, the answer is at the end of the day it's about, about writing a damn good story. Uh, yeah, and I think personally, like, I want... When I set out to write that, which should not be, I had a few very, very simple goals. Number one, I wanted to write a Lovecraftian novel. I basically wanted to write the book I wanted to read. Right. Um, and I didn't think there were that many Lovecraftian novels out there. There's a lot of great Lovecraftian short stories, but not a lot of novels. I wanted something that was gothic 
you know, I mean, I love modern horror as much as anybody, but I wanted sort of gothic, I wanted spires, I wanted storms, I wanted, you know, dark forest and, and unassailable... Or in the middle of nowhere. Forest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Interrupt, but, you know, that, that was really one of the things that I enjoyed about the book. It had nothing to... Well, not much, per se, to do with the fl plot. I love the plot, don't get me wrong, but the atmosphere, you know, Carter Weston goes to this tavern, and it's, it's literally on the cliff, as I understood it, at the edge of the ocean, and, you know, the waves are crashing and everything in the middle of a snowstorm, you know, and he mm -hmm. seeks shelter, and he meets these guys. I mean, that's, yeah. I love that kind of thing. Yeah, I just, you know, I was I was not going to be afraid of tropes. I mean, I, I, some people, I think, you know, I want to be original, and I want to write original stuff, but I think some people are so concerned about being original and so concerned about writing something that's never been written before that they they get away from a lot of things that, that you know, work. I mean, there's a reason that a storm on a cliff in the middle of a blizzard with waves crashing up into the tavern, you know, there's a reason that's evocative. I mean, that's, that's, there's a reason people write about that stuff, because you can imagine it, and you can see it, and you can feel it. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to do that. And um, and that's what I set out to do, and 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 I think it you know worked out pretty well, uh, oh. and and I sort of tried to do some more of that with with the sequel. Well, I, I think that it's it's very well. Look, it's Canterbury Tales. It's throwing mm -hmm. a whole bunch of different people together in a, in a room and mm -hmm. giving a reason for them to stay there. Exactly. You know, otherwise nobody would ever stick around for that long. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, it, but it's been, <laughs> you know, it's been used by. We're in sleep. We're not telling stories. Right, <laughs> right, right. But yeah, you have to give. You know, Dan Simmons has used it. Mike Resnick has used it. Spider Robinson has used it. It's a good way to, and it's actually, you know, I go to coffee bars. I go to bars a lot. We sit sit around and we tell stories. Mm -hmm. It yeah. works. It's a real world thing. And I know people poo-poo it, but it's because it's a trope. But it's a trope that's real, and it's really it, well used. It can be done excellent. And I, you know, as much yes, as much as I have problems with your Lovecraftian purism, <laughs> you know, the writing was excellent, and and the way you put it all together was great. It was, and I don't have a problem with that. What I and I said this to you, I believe it was yesterday. That when I talk with somebody, and you and I are you and I are friends. When I talk with somebody, that one thing I can't stand is when people disagree and they start yelling at each other. You know, yeah. it, to me, to my way of thinking, you disagree with somebody. It's great to talk with them because you might learn something. Okay, yeah. so one thing is my this is one of my favorite Lovecraft films. <coughs> but unlike Pete, I don't have a problem with that kind of thing because I don't really care about all that stuff. Uh, I care more about the themes. So speaking of the themes. Uh, yours is more of a, I guess you would say, Derlethian viewpoint. Um, you know, feel free to disagree with me. But basically, you know, Jehovah's in this, is, if I'm reading all this correctly, or at least he was, um, maybe he's still around somewhere, and he, he banished them at the beginning of time. Uh, you want, well, just jump in there. Do you agree with that, first of all, or disagree? It's, uh, it's, that differs from, Lovecraft, differs from Lovecraft a bit. Well, I, well, I would say this. I don't actually think it's a Dur Durlithian, um, just because I sort of had a sheltered Lovecraft life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I discovered Lovecraft through S.T. Joshi's Call of Cthulhu and Other Weird Tales, um, which I just found in a Barnes & Noble one day. And, mm -hmm. I, and I thought, you know, I feel like I've heard of this Lovecraft guy. And I feel like I've heard that he's good, so maybe I'll check this out. And I just tore through that book, right? And then I tore through everything Lovecraft's ever written, with the exception of the uh, the case of uh, Charles Dexter Ward and the only reason I haven't read that story and this is sort of weird and because I need to read the story is because I've read everything else that Lovecraft has written and I know that there will never be any more Lovecraft so I don't want to read the last story because then there won't be any more left. Well, but I don't I, know the <laughs> person would be writing Charles Dexter Ward stories, but yeah. go on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I need to get over there and read that. So I've never actually read anything by Darwin, um, and I understand actually. After writing this book, you know, and some people said that about Durlith, and so I had to go figure out what Durlith said, and then I realized, oh, okay, I can, I see why people say that. Um, even though I don't, I don't really like, you know, based on my Wikipedia research of Durlith, I don't really like the way he he did it. But having said all that, yeah, all that I, but let me just—I'm not talking about all this 
stupid labeling per yeah. se. I'm, just, I'm more talking about the the, the viewpoint. Right. So my viewpoint, the thing, the thing that I wanted to bring to it um, was hope, basically, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of people think is sort of anathema to Lovecraft, because Lovecraft's all about hopelessness. Um, but I actually, I actually don't think Lovecraft's all about hopelessness. I understand why Lovecraft lends itself nihilism, and I understand why we have a lot of people in the Lovecraftian tradition who who, lean, who tend towards nihilism. I guess Ligotti being the the most extreme, I and mean, he basically is a nihilist, I guess. Um, or like, you know, Lair Baron has a very dark, um, sort of hopeless worldview too, I think. But, you know, but when I look at Lovecraft, I get it. I get it that, that in, in the, so just in the Cthulhu mythos or whatever you want to call it, um, I know some people don't like that term. If you think about it, yes, you have this world where there's no sort of Christian god, right? There, there are gods, these right, ancient, right. you call them gods, but they're actually aliens or whatnot. Um... Right. And, I, and, and it's a universe where man doesn't matter. It's basically a hostile universe where, you know, everything's trying to kill us, basically, you know, from, from gamma ray bursts to, to whatever. Um, but, you know, what I see in Lovecraft is, in the end, there may not be any hope. Sort of in the end, you know, maybe Cthulhu is going to rise and, and, and the old ones are going to come back and, and whatnot. But... There are still people in, in Lovecraft's very best stories, who are, or what I think are his best stories, who are fighting to at least delay that and to yeah, hold very... back the tide. Yeah. And my favorite story, you know, which I know S.T. Joshi says is an artistic mistake, is the Dunwich Horror. And I love the Dunwich Horror. And, and that's sort of, it's that sort of idea that, that sort of inspired that which should not be. Because in the Dunwich Horror, you have this attempt, basically, to throw open the gates and bring back the old ones, and then Henry Armitage and a bunch of guys from Miskatonic, you know, they go out there to Dunwich and they fight back, and they and they win, you know, they win. Now, have they won forever? Of course not. You know, they've only bought us some time, uh, but they bought us some time, and they do it at great sacrifice. And so, sort of, my idea is, you can you can at least delay the inevitable. It's worth delaying the inevitable, because when you do that, you know, you save the earth for the people who are still living here or whatnot. But in order to do that, there's going to be sacrifice required. And in both That Which Should Not Be and He Who Walks in Shadow, there people don't necessarily win without sacrificing a whole lot to do it. And you see that a lot in He Who Walks in Shadow. It happens in That Which Should Not Be, and there's talk about sacrifice in That Which Should Not Be. But He Who Walks in Shadows is all about sacrifice. And Carter Weston, by the time we learn about him and, and he who walks the shadows, because as you said, he's the protagonist of that which should not be. And frankly, he does he doesn't do a whole lot. You know, I mean, he he sort of shows up, he listens to these stories, he's sort he's sort of there, he's recording the events, but he's not. He kind of moves it forward, but not too much, yeah. Exactly. Well, and he who walks the shadows, we learn a lot more about him, and we learn a lot more about Henry. And what we learn about Carter is that he is now willing to sacrifice anything to stop the old ones from coming. So that's sort of my, it's sort of hope, balance, and sacrifice. You know, what you're mind. saying kind of reminds me of the um, story in Genesis of, um, you know, God visits Abraham and says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, that's it. End of story. Shut the hell up. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course. And, uh, no, Abraham says, well, would you do it if there's, you know, nine good men in the city? Mm hmm and he says no, and he gets all the way to, well, I think, I think he starts at 90 and goes to 10. But he gets down to 10, and he goes, would you, would you spare the city if there's 10 righteous men in the city? And God said, yeah, I would, and there's not, so I'm not going to spare the city. It, it kind of reminds me of that a bit. Yeah. Is Abraham or Lot? Well, it's Abraham that God's talking about. He visits Lot's Abraham, in Lot lives in the city. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah. I think it's like Lot, his wife, and like his three daughters are the only ones there. So. Yeah, I don't find Lot all that righteous, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, Lot's not all that <laughs> When they made the movie version, Sodom and Gomorrah, they had him speaking a lot instead. Yeah. That's where I'm confused. That's where you're confused, Pete. You, yeah, saw, going, you saw the movie, Pete. So. Going back to that sort of the biblical thing and the God thing and the Jehovah thing or whatnot, I mean, yeah, my, my thought was basically... Why not have the Lovecraft mythos? Why not have the Cthulhu mythos? But truly have it in our world. And in our world, yeah. there are a lot of people who believe in, in Jesus and Jehovah, right? Now put aside whether or not Jesus and Jehovah exist. Maybe Jehovah is just a name for some entity we can't imagine that 
and got into a fight with the old ones back back a long time ago. I mean, there's for some reason that's never explained. These great, all-powerful creatures are not in charge, right? Like if he lives at the bottom of the ocean, the Arthotep's like wandering around, who knows where? Uh, <laughs> so, so, so why is that? I don't know. You know, if you want to call that reason, I like that, Brett. I actually like that. Now that we've and like I said, I'm learning something, and I like that. Um, I like the cost. You say this: right? you're allowed to have your own story uh-huh. and your own universe and your own vo- viewpoint. So I'm not criticizing. Yeah, all. yeah, but I mean, it is funny because I'm actually, I am actually Christian. I'm, you know, fairly devout Christian. But when I wrote that, which should not be, I wasn't thinking, man, I really want to get Christianity into this, you know. Right. <laughs> like, and so, like the cross thing, which a lot of people got upset about, because you know, people that use the cross and it actually does, you know, ward off the some of the some of the old ones to some extent. And my thought was, hey, you know, what if you see a vampire, you pull it across, and the vampire runs away? Well, is that because the cross is you know, somehow sacred because of Christianity, or could it be that the cross is an, is a sigil, is is you know like the elder sign or whatnot? And it's yeah, older like than time. Long. Yeah, exactly, and it just happens to work. But when someone sees it work, they think, oh, there's Jesus. Jesus is fighting for it. Right? There, there's <laughs> actually a story. It's a story by Frank Belknap Long called the Space Eaters. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. See, I need to read all this. Bring that up. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's sort of my apology, as it were, my defense of the uh, the Christian aspect. You can in, you can interpret but the Hans of Mandelos in those terms. Don't don't apologize for that. Yeah. Because here's this kid. We'll call him Brett, and <laughs> he's sitting at home, and he's got to go buy a loaf of bread, and he's got to get over to Lovecraftville. Now Brett was a nice kid. He was raised, I don't know, a Methodist. So part of being a Methodist, that frames his world, is one of the things that frames his worldview. So when he gets over to Lovecraftville and all this horrendous, evil, Lovecraftian shit's going on, he's, part of his interpretation is going to come through his age, his experience, what he's been conditioned by. And he was brought up a nice, nice Methodist kid, no matter what supernatural or ultra-natural things he he encounters, part of that is going to be interpretation based on him being a Methodist. So, there, you didn't do anything wrong at all. No, not at all. And uh, I really like what you said just now about Jehovah being something that we can't understand. You know, and that which should not be. Uh, one of the characters says, I have a theory that the word was just that, a word, but what a word it was. God is all-powerful, but he did not think the world into being. He did not think light into the dark, into darkness. No, all that was made was spoken into being. I, only, I believe it only took one word to make it so, his own name. And a little bit before that, he talks about, uh, you know, whoever this God being is that they're talking about. You know, he's the one that overthrew the old ones, and, you know, they're always trying to get back. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, and so... And it, you know, it works as a plot point too. So. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. Who is it, Rick? Is it Richard Tierney who, who um... goes the other route and makes God Yogg Sothoth? Yeah. yeah, God is Yogg right. Sothoth. That's actually the plot from the Drums of Chaos. Right. Yeah. Uh, what brilliant, brilliant book. Well, we have sort of two opposite views here, a, a Brett Talley uh, view and a Richard Tierney view. Yeah, uh, Pipes also joins in, which is I think, fine. I think, that's, I think that's great. You know, yeah. my thought is, and another reason when I wrote that, which should not be, and you know, this was, I was young and full of myself, was I thought, if I write this book, you know, people, maybe people will read it and they'll say, I want to read the original Lovecraft. And when people write to me and say, you know, I read your book, I never heard of Lovecraft, and then I read Lovecraft, and man, Lovecraft's amazing. I mean, that's like the ultimate compliment, right? And I think, I want everybody to read Lovecraft. Like, I want everybody to know that Lovecraft is one of the three greatest horror writers of all time. You know, you can pick which three you want to pick. Um, and I think the, the, that is more likely to happen if we have a lot of people who, who are writing Lovecraftian fiction that maybe isn't purely Lovecraft, where they're putting their own spin on it, and they're they're doing something original with it. You know, it's like Joe said. You know, you don't want to just read the same thing every time. 
you know, and 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 I love that, you know. So if there's if there's people who take the very opposite view of me, that's great. I want to read those guys. Too. You know, I'm I'm about a third of the way through He Who Walks in Shadow. I just want to read another brief passage that really stood out to me. Uh, there were many of there were of course many in his field of study that disagreed. Men who held that the forces we faced were not only cosmic in their nature but unfathomable in scope and power. The gods, they said, cared nothing for us. It was not hatred that drove them or evil that they personified, but simple indifference. We were not insects to them. We were bacteria, and they had no more compunction in wiping us out than we would in curing a disease. Yeah, and we, we talked about that on the show, too. You know, I think my comparison was, are humans cattle or are they insects? But that kind of jumped out to me as well. Yeah, you know, and, and my take on that, and I, and I think... I can't remember which character it was he's writing. I think it's Rachel, but maybe it's Carter. Uh, it was, yeah. And right after that, I think they say, you know, but to me, like, what difference does it make? Like, I don't, I don't care whether they're evil or whether they're indifferent. I just want to stop them because in my, because because I want to stop them, and whatever it is that's trying to destroy humanity, I will call evil, whether or not it's sort of evil in a, you know, Christianity point of view or not. Um, and so I think you can have, and I, and I know that you, you look back at Durleth, I mean, this is a lot of, a lot of people complain about Durleth, like, I think you can, you can have good versus evil in, in a Lovecraft story, and it doesn't have to be sort of traditional morality, good versus evil. It's just, you know, there's a bad guy who's trying to kill everybody, and you're trying to stop him. Hey, you've talked about that on this show before. You're muted. There you go. There, still there we go. You hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about the concept, you know, of evil. You know, and evil is 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 also based on perspective. I mean, if you are, for lack of a better term, Cthulhu, and you wake up and you see your planets, you know, covered with insects running around, <laughs> you know, you're gonna go get a can of raid. Right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And it's it, you, you're not going to think a second hand about it. And on the same token, you know, um, if you're Yatsathoth and you filter into a new new house and you've got this giant squid thing, you know, occupying your 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 cesspool, you're going to get rid of him too. You know, it's it's all a matter of perspective. And you know, the, the problem is that evil evil. Can, you can write evil with a big E, but then you better be ready to back it up with a point of view that makes sense. Right. And, you know, once again, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> in He Who Wants in Shadow, there is a lot of discussion about that, about the point of view of the old ones um, and how they see things. And, you know, that, yeah, the, you know, humans are basically invaders. They're interlopers. They're, they're the people who came and take, took what was theirs, and they're still on it. And why shouldn't they be able to fight back? Well, who, who, who are the good guys? You know, who are the bad guys here? You know. Right. Um, and so, so you know, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Like, I, I, I like having that sort of fluid dynamic with the good and evil thing. Well, and um, you, you know, let's let's look at you talked about you know hope. You know, and I, I make this argument. I think that the end of the shadow over Innsmouth is a real turning point for Lovecraft. Because the whole book is supposedly about how, oh my god, it's we're interbreeding with something that's completely alien, and we're going to be less than human, and it's it's horrible, and we've got to destroy them. Mm-hmm. But the, the very end of the book is, I, and I will go down and I will dwell in glory and, and, and wander forever. Yeah, it's, uh, yep. it's not less than human. His viewpoint is more. It, it, exactly. And it, it may be hinting that, you know, yes, the universe is a terrible place, and it's anti, uh, antithetical to our existence, but there may be ways that we can survive if we're willing to change our point of view and embrace some of that alienness. I, you know... I, we've had this discussion before. You know, some people agree with me, some people don't. Um, there's a there's a discussion about the same thing in the Dunwich Horror, in that you know the, the Waitley twins are once again another kind of human. They're they're 
um, augmented, they're, ex they're whatever, they're crossbreed, and they're prepared for the universe as it could possibly be, where we, as simply humans, are only pretty much trapped to our planet. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I have a question from the message board for you, Brett. Uh, Michael Parrish wants to know, Brett, how much time do you spend working your story into the existing mythos, or do you just start with the premise and let it weave itself as the story unfolds. You've done an amazing job with both The Thing That Should Not Be and He Who Walks in Shadow with blending existing characters in your universe with the mythos. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I guess I had several years of preparation to write these books. I didn't even realize it when I went out, you know, basically, the, you know, I get obsessed, I guess, is my thing. So, you know, there was a, there was a time... Where I, where, I just, where I didn't like the Beatles, and I realized, you know, the reason I don't like the Beatles is because I never listened to the Beatles. So I, so I listened to every one of the Beatles records in chronological order from the very beginning and realized, man, what an idiot I had been for the last however many years. And then all I listened to was the Beatles for, for months. <laughs> um, and so it was the same thing with Lovecraft, you know. When I discovered Lovecraft, I just read Lovecraft. Like I, I have, and I'm like everybody else here, I have so many different collections of Lovecraft. You know, I mean, all, they're all the same stories, and yet I still have all these. And I've read them dozens and dozens of times. So, really, at this point, I don't have to do a whole lot of time. When, I, when I'm sitting down to write a story, or I'm sitting down to write a book or whatever, I don't have to think a whole lot about it, um, because cause it's all sort of there already. Um, having said that, yeah, when, when I decided to write He He Walks in Shadow, I did reread a lot of Lovecraft, particularly anything that had to do with Neorthotep. Um, um, because I wanted to make sure it's, it's hard. It's hard to describe because, as as I've said, I'm it's not I, I'm not a slave to the mythos. Like I don't think, man, I've got to make sure this is consistent with everything Lovecraft wrote. Um, but I guess I want it to be both respectful of the mythos and recognizable. Um, I guess those are the two things that you know I do want when people to read it to to sort of see how this could all fit in. Um, to the other things they've read, uh, without without like I said having having to be so dogmatic. Yeah, I mean I guess that's it. Like dogmatic. I don't want to be dogmatic. Yeah. When it comes to yeah. Bill, Rick, anybody else? You guys have questions? Yeah, uh, I got a I got a question. So uh, Rick, a, a little bit stole stole my thunder with the uh, Nairlathotep uh, King in Yellow thing, but mm -hmm. what struck me when I uh, first read. Uh, he who walks in shadow was that this was just such a natural fit. Uh, it and and it, it, I, I literally put it down and wondered, okay, has anyone else done that? Has anyone else done that? Uh, I mean, may, maybe that got answered earlier, and I just kind of blanked on it or something. But uh, has anyone done that? That's that's. It, it seemed to me really obvious, and I'm wondering, has anyone else done that? I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I think Joe might be... I, I, I don't think anybody has, but the, where I was trying to head for was the justification for it is the Whisperer in the Darkness, which you quote a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, so the Whisperer in the Darkness, and, and I'll tell you, it was just what struck me, and the reason I did it was, was frankly... Um, I got on another one of my obsessive kicks where I read, <laughs> I read Chambers and and, and uh, the King in Yellow and had and, and was just blown away by it. Thought it was amazing, and I thought, man, I got to get this in there somehow. And then I remembered the cover for one of the books, uh, and I don't remember which one it is, but one of the, one of the King in Yellow books, you know, is this figure, um, and this you know yellow robe, and I think they have has wings or whatever, and and red wings. Yeah, and I thought to yeah, myself, the old age paperback probably, probably, probably is. Um, and I thought to myself, that's near all the tap. You know, he he, <laughs> that that is him. And then I started to think, well, you know, why couldn't they be the same? You know, near all tap is is someone who, you know, like most of the the old ones, can can bring madness to people and pestilence and plague. Yep, that's it. Yeah, and and. If you if you look at you know Arthotep and and the, you know the the, the Haunter of the Dark and, and 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 other stories, I mean, it just seemed to me that they fit together. Um, and so I decided to go for it. You know, 
the, the Whisper in Darkness is a reference to Nyarlathotep wearing a, whisper mask, in darkness. Yeah. a mask and uh, a robe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, and it just fits. I mean, because you think about that, and then you think about, you know, you think about the little snippets of the King in Yellow that you get throughout those stories, and, and I just thought there was a connection. Kind of brief moment of inspiration, just like, uh -huh. Yeah, just uh -huh. a brief moment of inspiration. Like, not... Not really tied to anything. Um, because, and, you, know, you know, when when I read, a lot of times I I, I I get struck with this moment of jealousy. Why didn't I think of that? You know, um, but all the time, you know, it, it seems, things seem so obvious that someone should have done this, and uh, that's just one of them. It worked so well. You know, it's and kind I, of funny. I just assumed people had done that before. Like, I didn't. I didn't even think about it being like a, a, a new thing. I just thought, you know, I'm going to go with that. And I actually, I've done it a couple more times. And, you know, I've got a story um, coming out in a collection that's going to be published this year uh, called uh, A Mythos Darkly. And it's basically fairy tales reimagined as, uh, you know, Lovecraftian mythos stories. And so I did the, the Piper in Yellow, um, which is a take <laughs> on the... the, uh, the um, the Pied Piper of Hamelin with sort of Nyarl Totep as the piper who comes to town. Um, and so, so I've actually done that a couple times and, and, and I'm going to sort of continue to do it. And hey, it's kind of cool if, if nobody had done it before. <laughs> and it actually fits in very well with Rats in the Wall and uh, the Graveyard Rats by Henry Cutler, which mentions a piper composing mm -hmm. rats. Yeah, well, you know, it's sort of music. That sort of music plays such a big role in a lot of these stories. And you think about Azatoth and, and, and the drummers and the piping, and, and and then you think about you know Eric Zahn and, and the violin and all that sort of stuff. It, it just fits so well into the whole mythos. I like to include that when I can. Never read the case of Charles Dexter Ward. I've never read a case of Charles Dexter Ward, and I'll tell you what else I've never read, which this always surprises people because they think because they basically think I totally ripped this off. Um, <laughs> I've never read *The Wendigo* by Algernon Blackwood, uh, which, which apparently, you know, the first story in that which should not be, and *The Wendigo* by Algernon Blackwood have a lot in common. But I've never. Yeah, that never does surprise it. me. Not, not that you ripped it off. A lot of people have written. Uh, yeah. There have been a few Wendigo stories. You know, there's a Robert Price anthology that that he edited. The name escapes me right now. The Quad Cycle. The what? It's a qua cycle. Yeah, yeah. I forget uh, who it was. I forget who it was. He said like you just should never lie because then you have to remember what you said. But <laughs> it, it reached a point where people, well, that would should not be. I'd be doing an interview or whatever, and they'd be like, and clearly, you know, you're really inspired by Algernon Blackwood and the Wendigo, and I'd say, oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, really inspired. <laughs> but you know, I still haven't read it. It's one of those things I mean to get back and read. And obviously, clearly, I now have to read a case of Charles Dexter Ward. Since I've been into that, people are shaming me. The case of Charles Dexter Ward has, has, has the best thing about Lovecraft, and that is necromancy. Yeah. It is very, <laughs> it's really, really ghastly and yeah. awful. I know you're a big and fan. That, <laughs> yeah. So it's a. Uh, Rick, you yeah, want to say something? Yeah. Uh, where, where did you get the idea for the Wendigo from? You know, the Wendigo was just something I thought was really cool, basically. You know, and I had read a lot about it, and um, and I wanted to write a story about the Wendigo. And I thought, hey, you know, the Wendigo totally could be an old one. You know, <laughs> he just he, he could fit totally into this whole sort of you know idea. So, and then I read through the backstory about how the Wendigo was an old one. He sort of got banished by the old ones at some point, and because he was banished by the old ones, and all the old ones got banished, he sort of remained stronger than the rest of them. And that's why he was able to, to manifest himself more easily. Um, but yeah, I just I just thought it was a really cool story. So I decided to go with it. You know, but I think what's most important that you is that you work a uh, Ghostbusters reference into a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which there is a Ghostbusters reference in uh, He Who Walks in Shadow. I don't know. Are we giving it away? Are we Are we hinting? I, it's, you're the author. I don't, There's I don't also. There's also a Sherlock Holmes reference. Oh man, what Sherlock Holmes? What, which one was the Sherlock Holmes reference? <laughs> the name of the French inspector. Really? Hmm, this is interesting. I think this might be a coincidence. <laughs> What's the name of the French inspector again? Uh, was it Francois Laviard? Laviard. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's the name of an inspector. I mean, it can't be the same guy, but it's the name of the inspector in the sign of four. Oh, wow. That's that's a total coincidence. Maybe that that's was subconscious on your part. Yeah, I guess I should be like, I, I should pull this, the same thing I did with the Wendigo and be like, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, but I love that. Like, I really like to include that stuff in the stories. I like having the little, you know, references to things, random things. So, yeah, I mean, so there's a reference to the, to the Ghostbusters, and I'll go ahead and say what it is. Um, you know, if you've ever seen Ghostbusters, you know that they rely constantly on Tobin's spirit guide. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is an epistolary uh, story, and some of the chapters are actually sections out of different books. You know, they could be, like, historical books. So there's one, a book that Carter Weston wrote, um, and one of the sections is a chapter in a book called... Uh, a guide, a guide to demons and otherworldly spirits, or something like that, by Portram Tobin, which obviously is Tobin's spirit guide. Um, and it's the section, it's the chapter on the author tip. So, <laughs> you know, I just decided to throw that in there and see if anybody noticed. And the first person noticed a couple days ago, and it made me really happy. <laughs> There's some character named Holloway in the book too, in He Who Walks in Shadow. Yeah, yeah, there, yep. Yep. there, there are. Uh, I, you know, I really like to kill my friends in books. Um, so people, people. Uh, the last book I wrote, which was actually not Lovecraftian, was called The Reborn, and I, I just killed everybody I knew in that book. So. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever read Lovecraft's revisions, like The Mound? No, I haven't. That, that's that's oh, my next thing I want to read. I want to okay. read those because I'm saying you can read Case of Charles Dexter Ward now because. You would have oh, all yeah. the visions to read, which are a ton of stories that you haven't read. The only one, you know, somebody should, should I don't know if there's a collection just of his revisions, yeah, or if yeah. it's one of those things I have to hunt down. I've read Under the Pyramid, which I know he did with uh, Houdini, uh, but I haven't read The Mound. So. But, but, but there's a collection by, uh, there's a two-volume set that uh, S.T. Joshi uh, annotated. Okay. And I'm trying to get into reading sort of more of these, his contemporaries, uh, well, you know, I like Mackin and people like that. See Rick, I, I thought the new Valerium edition was three volumes. I just, I didn't realize he did that. Many. Well, I, uh, I, they don't have the Valerian edition, but he did, he did, he did a two-volume uh, set. One, in, one is Medusa's Coil. It was sort of like the three-volume set he did for Penguin. But I can't remember what the other one, the other title is. Oh, yeah, no, uh, no I, but I thought he had something brand new, three-volume. Wait a minute, what's Matt doing? Matt's looking it up, or he's holding it. You want to focus on Matt? Crawling Chaos and Others. Yeah. And Medusa's oh, Coil and other way. Back, oh, back. Okay. Medusa's That's Coil and other. Okay. Yeah, they have some excellent annotations. You discover that uh, Arthur German is directly tied to the Cthulhu mythos by one of the Lovecraft's revisions, which I did not know. Hmm. Hmm. I'm gonna have to well, say we'll read it. Look, look. St. has done mountains of incredible research, and he's been back into Lovecraft and back into Lovecraft and back into Lovecraft, annotating, revising, whatever. And now he's writing. So go read the Charles Dexter Ward. Get that off your out of the way, because. Next, what ST is going to do is, I think he's going to rewrite all the Lovecraft stories. <laughs> well, just so don't steal Lovecraft. Yeah. God huh? Just don't read. Just don't steal a car after you read it. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, you commit one bad act. <laughs> you confess to it. You know what? You know, you will Pete, never be president. That's a, that's a felony. <laughs> It's a felony, Pete. You will never be president. A bad, a bad act is when you stole your sister's lollipop. <laughs> Stealing you know, a car, even if it's your grandmother's, that's called a felony. He was never charged, though. 
Well, it's because it was his grandmother. <laughs> he was yeah. only borrowing it. Oh, bar yeah. Well, he's he's got this poor girl snowed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 leave oh, my whoa. boss. Leave her alone. Did he tell you all kinds of stories about the yacht, too? <laughs> oh, I know all about the yacht. Oh, whoa. Okay, I have to go back and revisit the FBI file. Okay. <laughs> what? I've seen, I've been in his FBI file. I've seen the pictures of the girls. Clothes on, clothes off. The, the you know, the crystal all over the place. The Learning all kinds of things. Yeah, you are. You know, you know, Brett is a nice, young Methodist boy. <laughs> I can't help it. You know what? If he's going to write Lovecraftian fiction, he's going to have to discover it's a big, goddamn, cruel world. And he thinks he thinks Ligotti's dark. Yeah, well, Pulver, he's a little dark, too. You know, you know? do we get the trigger warnings for this show? No, no, I don't know. Oh. You know, Brett, you're going to say. For, uh, if Brett's interested in Lovecraft's uh, contemporaries, the one who would fit in very well with what he's done is Robert Block. Oh, there's, there's a lot of stuff with Naya Lafotep and how he might fit into Jewish folklore. Ah. He's like identified with Asmodeus in uh, two stories, uh, The Dark Demon and the Faceless God. So you can get into things like the Book of Tobin. And you were talking about the Asmodee. Mm-hmm. Who was sort of, uh, Block sort of does the same, except he calls them the Druids, but he's got that whole thing as human sacrifice or whatever. That gotcha. Milk. Yeah, I just and love that Block stuff. I think that's Block. such a rich mind, you know, that people can draw. Block from. is incredible. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read Block, you got it. Block's, you know, he's a saint at least. And what's amazing is most of those missile stories were written when he was uh, a teenager. Yeah. Uh, you also have a book out that I just want to remind people that maybe that or tell people that maybe don't know about it called The Void, mm -hmm. which I kind of saw as a maybe a Lovecraftian science fiction set in the future. Right. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you don't see it that way, but you want to talk about that for a second? No. Yeah. No. I think that's that's, that's a scary a book. That's a good book. That's exactly what it is, is a Lovecraftian book set in the future. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's my second book. Um, you know, it's funny, like, <laughs> that book is Lovecraftian science fiction, and Lovecraftian people really like it. Science fiction people hate it, <laughs> which I kind of like. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's set in the future. It's, it's about, basically, there's this, uh, you know, in order to travel through space, you know, um, short story here. In order to travel through space, you have to be asleep. Because uh, if you don't, you go crazy. But even if you are asleep, you still have these crazy, weird dreams. Oh, that's a, that's a Stephen King story. The John. Well, see, that's the thing about Stephen King. He's written everything, right? <laughs> that, well, that was more of a teleportation thing. This is yeah, travel. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But just back to Stephen King. It's like it, Stephen King always reminds me of that episode of uh, South Park, where it's like the Simpsons already did it. You know, if you're if you're a hard writer, you you always have to deal with the fact that Stephen King at some point somewhere has written something that people are you know, he's already thought of it. But anyway, yeah. So basically, yeah, they they travel through time and all these weird things happen and they see these weird creatures and the story is basically they're trying to invent this this new way to travel that avoids all that um, because people keep going crazy and they come across this ship that's been lost for a decade and they sort of have to figure out why it was lost and. Um, you know, it's got some. The book, you know, the book's got some. Uh, you know, if you want to look at inspirations, it's got some of some of the uh, the Event Horizon, like Alien. It's all of that sort of space horror uh, with a Lovecraft tied together with a Lovecraftian bow, is what I would say about it. But. Yeah, um, I don't want to say they're anything really the same, but I did think a little bit of Jeff when I read that book. Um, is this crazy? Or no, I'm curious if connection or you know, sorry, Rick, what? I was just say, does Jeff's punk, the Jeff's punk town novels, did, not, did those novels get the same reaction from the science fiction community that Brett felt that 
You know, I, I, uh, I, I think I've been, I've reached a science fiction audience and a horror audience. Uh, I, I, uh, you know, of course, you're, every, you know, any book's going to get some poor reviews, you know, but they don't seem to be skewed toward science fiction people or horror people. It just seems to be an, an individual reaction once in a while. You're just not resonating with somebody. But I haven't noticed any, any kind of genre audience that has been less receptive than another. Yeah, let me just say to anybody out there who's not read Jeff's Hometown books, you're missing out. Uh, I mean, oh, all yeah. of the books, but the, 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 the first the first collection belongs. Anybody with any interest in weird fiction has got to have the first at minimum the first collection on their shelf. If, if not, you have a severe hole in your in one of your bookcases. You know, there's writers that I've met that I read their work after I met them, and there's writers that I read their work before I met them. Uh, Jeff's one of those writers. You know, so it was really, it was great to meet him after having read a couple of his books. You know, picked them up on I think on Amazon or whatnot. But uh, yeah, go to go to Amazon and type in Jeffrey Thomas, and you'll be very pleased, I think, with the results when you read them. Yeah, in in many ways, the, the Punk Town books are um, a precursor to um, China Meville's Bass Lag novels. Mm. And I think, and I think, in some ways, they actually do it better. Oh, <laughs> I think uh, it, China's um, Perdido Street Station came out at the same time as Punk Town, and actually, and we kind of were like interested in each other because of, I think we superficially our approach sounded a little similar. So at that time, we reached out to each other and started corresponding a little bit. And he was very kind and offered me a blurb for Punk Town, and so uh, I think we. We kind of just came onto the scene with our, with our visions at the same time, you know. You know, just similar uh, synchronicity, I guess. Um, when I when I published that, which should not be, uh, it was the same time as uh, uh, Southern Gods came out by uh, Joseph Warner oh, Jacobs. Jacobs or something. Yeah, something like that, um, which is. Has sort of a similar feel to it, and I love that book. So if we're just throwing out, we're throwing out recommendations, I would say that was a, that's a good one to look up. Yeah, who's that by Rick you, or Pete? Yeah, Connor, right? Connor Jacobs, something like that. I'll find the reference, Mike. Is it John okay. Jacob Horner or John Horner Jacobs? One of those two. Yeah, one, one of the one other of the two. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun book. I read it. Yeah. We got the title right. I know that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a sequel coming out soon. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Um, okay. Hey, anybody uh, wants to read one of Jeff Thomas's best short stories for free, they can go to Weird Fiction Review and search for The Fork. Um, it's an amazing story. It's not quite as good as the original version. Spoon. <laughs> um, which was The Spoon. But it's damn good. <laughs> and you have a kind of a nod to that in this book with a story called The Pencil. <laughs> yeah. The, oh, The Pencil, yeah. Right. No, you, uh, can also, you can also read Brett Talley, Joe Pulver, and Jeff Thomas books. And let, me, let me put Pete on the screen. And Pete Rollick books. And Rick's book, or not books, uh, stories. I didn't mean books, I meant stories. Uh, several of their stories uh, at Lovecraft Museum website, the magazine portion. Oh, yeah, yeah, I put yeah. all your books online, Jeff. Is that yeah, okay? We should go up in that once in a while. What's that? I said we show up in that once in a while. Yeah, once in a while. And, and, and some of us are showing up in that... Uh, Autumnal uh, Yog Sathari or something. What is that? You're talking about Autumn Cthulhu? Oh, Autumn Cthulhu. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to think about. <laughs> well, I'm waiting on a, a story. Yeah, I'm almost waiting done. waiting on a friend. Yeah, I'm waiting on, on some somebody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah he's, he's worth the wait. Worth the wait. Trust me, bro. He's <laughs> worth the wait. I think we all know who we're talking about. But Every yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, maybe somebody else. Uh, okay. Maybe two somebody else's. But uh, I've got. I just accepted a story by Nadia Bolkin. Uh, Yay. What a great writer. Yeah. And I did too. She's in Casilda's song. Repair uh, of reputation, fans. Hold on to your socks. Hey, Jeff, when we sign off, don't go anywhere. Okay. You, you were talking about Laird writing dark stuff that... <laughs> Uh, but he, he throws in some humor too. Uh, but it's still oh, a yeah. scary as hell story. This one's titled "Andy Kaufman Creeping Through the Trees." <laughs> what a great title! <laughs> That'll be an Autumn Cthulhu. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a privilege to um, re be the first, or at least they probably had beta readers. I don't know if Laird did or not, uh, or if everybody does that. But at least among the very first to read stories by these guys. Like Scott Thomas and Laird Barron and people like Nadia Wolkin and Damian uh, Walters. Um, so they're in the book. Pete Rollick, Joe's in the book. Anne's got a story? poem. Not as far as you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, you gave it to me a long time ago. Yeah, you were actually the first person to give it to me. Oh, well, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> um. Richard Gavin, Daniel Mills. So these guys are great. So I think it's going to be a really good book because these people are in it. Yeah, so. it's a it's an amazing experience to be the first or whatever person to read something that's going into an anthology and getting all charged up, honked up, you know, knowing there's some people out there who are going to sit in their easy chair and going to be getting off. Well, so, you know, and, you know, what? <laughs> they're back to erotica, I say. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matt must know something about that now, because, you know, Matt took the plunge this week, right? Yeah, actually, oh, yes. I, 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 figured out, I figured out how to make a small fortune in publishing. Oh, you start, really? You start with a that large fortune. <laughs> What did you say? You start, start with a large with fortune. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, all right. I was going to say, because for, for those of us who are starving, we, we really want to hear this segment of the show. No, 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 he said publishing, not writing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, shut up, Palmer. Um, yeah, well, while we, Matt... While we're, picking on, while we're picking on Jeff Thomas, um, I mentioned briefly... Um, Finishing up Leaves of a Necronomicon, uh, Jeff wrote the left last chapter of, of this. And uh, that Jeff Thomas, you know, he's pretty goddamn good. <laughs> um, beyond, beyond please, to, like, close this book with Jeff Thomas. Beyond, please. Okay, uh, I'm done now. Matt. What's the name of the anthology you're editing with, Sam? It is titled A Lonely and Curious Country. That quote's taken from the beginning of the Dunwich Horror. It's basically, we're following a cue from Pete Rollick, who suggested that with everyone ginned up to write stories for anthologies to be published around the time of the Necronomicon, there might be quite a few stories floating around without homes. We could potentially assemble a, a decent anthology pretty quickly. So we're giving it a go. So I've, I put the submission page up again at your easing board. Um, uh, we're just looking for, this is for new authors, authors of any background. There's no real restrictions. You know, just something that you don't have a home for that you think is pretty good. I'm more interested in like 15 very readable stories than a particular theme. Are you getting anything yet? What's that? Have you gotten any yet? Oh, well, I've gotten like 15 submissions. Of those, there are two I will definitely say yes to. There are four that I think I'll say yes to, unless I get deluged with other great stuff. And I got a promise 
from an author whom I won't name that he's going to write something specific for the book. But I've got I got I got space where uh, Sam is the publisher. He wants to do seventy five thousand words, which amounts to about fifteen stories. So who's the publisher? Um, Ulthar Press. They they do Sargasso. He's his main interest is actually William Hope Hodgson. I think he's just hoping that he could potentially get a modestly successful anthology based on the current interest in the upcoming convention. I think it's neat that you guys went off of Pete's suggestion and did that. Sorry, Rick, were you gonna say something? No. Well, it it was just it was just odd because you know, there were like I don't know, five or six anthologies that had just closed out like a month and a half ago, and rejection notices were pouring in. And what I realized in, is that there were a lot of good stories out there that just didn't make the cut. They're still good stories, they just didn't fit that anthology. Right. And so, why not take advantage of that? Yes, you are you are you picking up scraps? I don't look at it that way. No, because there's it, it, I've, re I've rejected several stories lately that I've told the authors, look, yeah, I'm not rejecting because it's a bad story. I'm rejecting because it doesn't fit what I'm looking for. You know, you should, you should shop it around and direct them to the Lovecraft Easing submissions page yeah. where I list this and other ones. But, but and, yeah, and, it doesn't mean it's a bad and, and story. And you're both right. And the other thing too is, you you can have two amazing stories, um, and they're both. The, I don't want to say they're both the same. But you got these two sub submissions, and they touch upon the same things. And you know, it's like maybe a different day you would have picked B instead of A. Right. Um, and Pete's exactly right. You can have a really great story that's this far off of what you're looking for. So when you start to put it together with the other things on your TOC, it just doesn't fit. Yeah. You know. Um, re rejection, and unless somebody sends it back and on a red pen, somebody wrote, this sucks. Um, rejection doesn't mean it was a bad story. Well, that's what uh, Salome did to my story, but... <laughs> well, uh, that's because she... Well, you know, her parents brought her up not to lie. <laughs> so, there you go. No. Grin and bear it, Davis. Grin and bear it. Nah, she accepted it. Oh. Oh. I didn't yeah. that story. Did the submission come with a big check? <laughs> That's <laughs> what I was told. Me and Mike. <laughs> well, all I know is that, you know, I had, you know, Salome has, has compromising pictures of me now. And <laughs> okay, lucky girl. <laughs> nah. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the prizes here in a second, but I want to say something about that too. The the reverse can happen too. You know, Damien sent me this story for Autumn Cthulhu, and you know we're talking about stories that don't they're good stories but they don't quite fit, or even great stories that don't quite fit. Um, so you have to reject them. But then you get stories that you're like, I didn't even know I wanted this, but this fits into the anthology so perfectly. You know that she knew exactly what I was trying to say, and maybe some things that I didn't know that I wanted. But when I read the story, I knew that I did. You know, so the reverse can happen as well. So that is a damn good story. You read that, Joe? You were you were the beta reader, I think. Uh, Damien, yeah, I might know a little bit about that story. She's a Pretty, pretty damn good writer, the way Pulver adds up the numbers. Uh, so, if you want one of these ten signed books, and then I'm going to get to some really important news that I'm sure made Molly Tanzer very happy, uh, send an email. Please don't send it to the regular email address. We changed that several months ago. Uh, today, I'm going to... I say I, Brett's doing all the work and the signing and the mail and the postage. But <laughs> we'll give away five books today. I, I, I'll do three, let's do three, that which should not be, and and two, he who walks in shadow. And then on Wednesday, I'll do another drawing for those that can't watch this live but are watching the recorded version, and we'll do 
the five that are left, three who walk, he who walks in shadow, and two that which should not be. And my understanding is Brett's going to sign them um, and send them to you. And please send an email to Lovecraft Easing, E Z I N E Prizes, P R I Z E S, at gmail.com. It's just basically the magazine name, Lovecraft Easing, and the word prizes at gmail.com. But in the subject, it's really important that you put either that which should not be or um, he who walks in shadow. You know, please don't do both. Uh, and I'll use random.org a little bit after the show to pick the first five winners, and then I will send them on to Brett. I will also announce them on the message board. So, um, you know, let me just write that email address at the, at the message board. And the good news that Molly is very happy about is there's supposedly going to be a uh, uh, big trouble in Little China, too. Yes. Yep. I don't know if that's a good thing. Wow. <laughs> I mean, uh, how, why? Why? God, why? You don't need it. it. Well, no, it's supposed to be a sequel, not a remake. Yeah, but... Oh, well, man. maybe... I don't maybe. Know. If, it, if Kurt Russell's in it, it might be good. <laughs> what, are you going to push him around in a wheelchair? <laughs> it's got to be set decades later. I mean... Yeah, it's like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is so good. He's not that old. I mean, he's... Like Pulver's age or something, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Don't be picking on Kurt Russell. He's going to be in Hateful Eight. Well, maybe maybe the hero will be Kurt Russell's son, and you're going to see him as the father of the new hero. That'd be okay, I guess. Shia LaBeouf. I don't know. Anybody but, make... They're also, also going to be making one the eight samurai. <laughs> 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 Well, all I can say is if we're not back by dawn, call the president. Okay. <laughs> oi, oi, oi. All right. Big trouble on the little China line. So yeah. anyway, anyway I, uh, I think i got to talk to a couple of you guys. So anybody wants to hang around, feel free. But uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. I'll do the drawing in a little bit, and I'll do another drawing on Wednesday. Pick up uh, House of Hollow Wounds and He Who Walks in Shadow and That Which Should Not Be and Jeffrey Thomas's new chat book. Um, Ghost and Amber. Sorry, excuse me for a second there. From Dim Shores. Dim Shores. They can probably just what is it? Dimshores.com. I believe it is. Top or, is if on Facebook, or if you're on Facebook, look up Sam Cowan. Or Dim yeah, or, or Google Ghost and Amber. Jeffrey Thomas. I'm sure that'll get yeah. you there too. Or go to Jeff Thomas's Facebook page. All right. Well, we'll see everybody next week. Thanks for watching.